Hello medicos, this is Dr. Pawan, your surgery educator on an academy platform and I welcome you to another session of Dungeons and Dragons. In this, we will be talking about how will you evaluate a patient with a large prostate gland. Okay, so let us begin and let us talk about it. So the case scenario which we have is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. There is a 52 year old man who is coming to you uh, like in a urology OPD with the complaint of hesitancy of the urine, frequency of the urine and nocturia okay since two months what do you suspect so here there is a 52 year old man who is coming to you with hesitancy which is uh, obstructive symptom and then you have a frequency in nocturia these are the kind of irritative symptoms of the which you get in the LUTS lower urinary tract symptoms and since two months the patient is having this since two months what do you suspect so no doubt you suspect this particular patient to be suffering from a benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So yes, you do suspect in this particular patient a benign prosthetic hyperplasia that is a BPH. Now, the point of the matter is how will you evaluate this particular person? So how will you evaluate? As soon as the person comes, he narrates the history to you. What you will do? You will ask the patient to go to the examination table and you will go and you will do a per rectal examination of this particular patient. If you do a per rectal examination, what are the findings you are going to get? So can you please tell me what are the findings you will get? So if at all you do a particular examination, you will see that there is a firm prostate gland on palpation. It is a firm prostate gland. It is not a hard prostate gland. Hard prostate gland, that is more indicative of a prosthetic carcinoma. But here you get a firm prostate gland. Definitely it is enlarged, no doubt. And there is a median sulcus between the two lobes of the prostate. There is a median sulcus. When you palpate it with the, you know, this part of your finger, you, this, you feel that that particular median sulcus has got obliterated. You cannot reach the upper border of the prostate, which you can usually do if at all you palpate a prostate in a normal man, uh, normal men. And yeah, the overlying mucosa over that particular prostate gland that is free. Now, why is this important? Why is this mucosa well a feature important? Because let's say if at all there was a patient who is coming to you with a prostatic carcinoma, there is a very, very high likely chance that the mucosa overlying the prostate gland wouldn't have been free it would have been nodular okay so these are the features which you will get in the per rectal examination in this particular patient okay so you will do a per rectal examination and once you have done this per rectal examination you will ask the patient to fill up a score you will give a sheet to the patient and you will ask him so just go and fill this particular sheet so what is this particular sheet it is called as a ipss now what is this ipss please 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 understand this this is an international prostate symptom severity score so what is it it is basically a international international prostate symptom severity score okay it is a symptom severity score now what exactly is this particular thing so it is like a questionnaire okay so for example when you do a shopping or you do anything you get a feedback form right and that what you get you have certain questions and then you are asked to grade your experience on the basis like one to five in the similar manner what we have done is that we have come up with a questionnaire so this is what is a ipss questionnaire looks like so as you're able to appreciate that there are multiple questions in the first column so you have around seven questions which you ask to this particular patient and these all these seven questions are related to the symptoms of the patient so for example incomplete emptying of the bladder frequency intermittency urgency weak stream straining and the nocturia so all these are the symptoms which are usually kind of associated with the prostatic pathologies it is not specific for the bph please understand this okay so these are the LUTS that is lower urinary tract symptoms okay so it is not kind of only related to BPH but yes it is mostly related to the BPH and based on whatever the experience the patient is having the severity of the symptom is patient basically marks for example he can mark anything like two four five three whatever so at the end what you do you basically add all the responses which the patient has marked and then you calculate a score okay you calculate a score now please understand the maximum value which you can get is a 35 and based on it you basically divide kind of whatever the symptoms of the patient are on the basis on these particular pieces you divide it into mild symptoms moderate symptoms and the severe symptoms so if at all the score comes out to be between 1 to 7 the patient is having mild symptoms if at all the score comes out to be between 8 to 19 the patient is having moderate symptoms and if at all the score comes out to be between 20 to 35 the patient is having severe symptoms so please get this very very straight 
what you're getting in here this is an international prostate severity symptom score okay it is a symptom score and on the basis of whatever the markings the patient has done whatever the score you get you divide these symptoms into mild moderate and severe mild means you have a score between 1 to 7 moderate means you have a score between 8 to 19 and the severe means you have the score between 20 to 35 okay so yeah we have done with this this is an ipss score so yes i mean when the patient comes you do a peer examination and you ask the patient to fill this ipss score then what so this is the opd basis what you can do on the opd basis and then what you do you advise the patient to go for some investigations now can you please tell me in the comment box what are the investigations which you will advise to this particular patient so let me think, I am dealing with a patient in my mind, there is an elderly male who is coming to you, who is coming to me with let's say the symptoms which I have just described. I did a PR examination, I felt that the prostate is enlarged, it is kind of firm and the IPSS score let's say came out to be around 20. Okay, so what will you suspect? Obviously you will suspect that the patient is suffering from a BPH. What are the investigations which I will advise in this particular patient before I proceed with the management? So I will basically go for, I would like to go for a USG, okay? Then I would like to go for a PSA levels. I will like to go for a Euroflowmetry and then I will like to go for a Eurodynamic study. So I'll tell you each one of it, what is the significance of each one of these particular tests? Just stay with me. So first, what did I tell you? I would like to go for a USG. Now, why would I like to go for a USG? I would like to go for a USG because I want, I'm interested in the prostate size and the prostate volume okay so i'm basically just uh, kind of interested in the prostate size and the prostate volume okay so i'm kind of interested in that then what i'm interested in i'm interested in the post void residual volume so after the patient has completed his voiding what is the amount of urine which is still remaining in the bladder okay so let's uh, can you please tell me what is the normal size of the prostate gland like in a normal individual what is the size of the prostate gland it's close to around 15 20 at max 25 grams or something like that but if at all it is more than that it means that there is an enlarged prostate what about the post void residual volume well ideally the post void residual volume should be nil at the max it can be around 5 to 10 ml or something like that but if at all let's say it is 50 or 100 or something like that it is significant okay i hope you get this now very very important thing is i want to look whether there is any back pressure changes which is happening in this particular patient what do you mean by this back pressure changes so let's say because of this particular prostate is the urine getting accumulated it is causing a back pressure on the kidneys and the kidneys are getting affected is it so if at all it is so i have to go for an intervention in this particular patient so that is why i have to rule out hydronephrosis and lastly i want to see if at all there is any surrounding lymph node enlargement or something like that why because maybe i'm not dealing with the bph maybe i'm dealing with the prosthetic carcinoma and if at all it is that i will have a lot of pelvic lymph nodes enlargement okay so let's rule out the lymph node enlargement so this is what the information i'll get on the usd now this is a usd which i've shown you this is a prostate which is enlarged and it is basically pushing up on the bladder and i hope you're able to appreciate this is a kind of a narrow urethra so basically it is a kind of a transfer section which you're looking at and this is basically the urinary bladder i hope you get this this is a urethra I hope you get this nothing great nobody will nobody's going to show you usd and ask you it is just for your information now, what did I next tell you? I told you that I would like to have a PSA levels of this particular patient. Now, what is a PSA? So it is basically, again, prostate specific antigen. It doesn't tell me whether the patient is having a BPH or the patient is having a carcinoma prostate or something like that. It doesn't tell me that. What is it? It is a prostate specific antigen. It means that larger the size of, of the prostate gland, higher will be the PSA levels. So please understand it is prostate specific, but as far as the disease is concerned, it is neither sensitive nor specific, okay? So the values are not reliable, not at all reliable. But yeah, if at all, let's say the patient is having a PSA of more than 30, there is a very, very high likely chance that the patient is having a metastatic prostatic carcinoma. Important guys, important. You need to remember this. If at all the PSA is more than 30, most probably the patient is having a metastatic prostatic carcinoma. But what about the localized prostatic carcinoma? The PSA levels are usually within 10. And so is for the BPH. Like for example, if at all the PSA range between 4 to 10, the patient may have BPH, the patient may have prostatic carcinoma, who knows? We don't know that. So that is why we have come up with the guidelines. Like when will you advise a prosthetic biopsy in a patient? When will you advise it? Very, very important. Please understand the threshold for a prosthetic biopsy is P0.5. 
PSA level of 3 very very important more than 3 nanograms per ml if you have a PSA you are justified in ordering a biopsy of this particular patient because now it is your uh, kind of a role to rule out any prostatic carcinoma or maybe the patient is having a just a BPH okay so how do you go for a biopsy there are two methods of going for a biopsy you can either go through a truss guided biopsy that is a trans rectal ultrasound guided biopsy or you can go for a perineal biopsy now perineal biopsy is basically coming up the role and the importance of the perineal biopsy is coming up but still if today somebody asks you what is the kind of an investigation of choice or what is the kind of a route of choice to take up a biopsy definitely it is a trust guided biopsy okay right we won't go into the details of that because that is more related to the prosthetic carcinoma but yeah i mean the threshold for the prosthetic biopsy is 3 nanograms per ml if at all you have a patient with a PSA levels of more than 3 nanograms per ml you uh, can definitely advise the prosthetic biopsy because you want to rule out a prosthetic carcinoma okay now what did i tell you the next investigation which we will go for is a uroflowmetry now what do you understand by this uroflowmetry and what is the aim of performing this particular investigation why do you want to get this uroflowmetry done because you want you are basically interested in knowing the rate of flow of the urine you are basically interested in knowing what is the rate of flow of the urine in this particular patient okay that is what you are interested in so what you do is that you basically ask the patient okay go into the okay so first of all you ask the patient to drink a lot of water and then you ask the patient to just hold the urine do not wipe it just hold the urine until you get like you cannot no longer control the urine okay so you ask the patient to wait till he can no longer control the urine once kind of it is done then what you do you ask the patient to go to a private room in the kind of a you know isolated room the patient basically voids and he voids on a container so i hope you're able to appreciate this is a kind of a container and this container is basically kept on a sensor so there is a sensor on which you have kept up a container and the patient is basically voiding in this container so what is happening the sensor is taking up whatever the signals the signals are getting kind of transmitted to a computer and by this particular process you are getting a graph like this and this is what we are interested in guys okay so i hope you understood how do you perform a uroflowmetry you ask the patient to go to kind of a you know isolated room pass the urine on the container the container is kept on the sensor the sensor is connected to a computer and by like in during the process of voiding the signals are basically continuously transmitted to the computer and we personally get this particular graph at the end of the test and what we are actually interested in this qmax so there are various other things which are related to uroflowmetry forget about it all we are interested at this particular moment is qmax okay now there is one tiny detail which is good if at all you remember so okay so in this particular patient there is a chance that the patient cannot hold a lot of urine and let's say the patient has only 100 ml of the urine and the patient had an urgency and the patient had to void the urine but this particular uroflowmetry might not be taken kind of reliable so please understand the minimal amount of urine which the patient should void in order to consider the uroflowmetry as a reliable is 150 ml 150 ml okay i hope you get this particular point okay so the minimum amount of the urine needed to be voided by the patient in order to consider that particular uroflowmetry curve as a reliable that is 150 ml okay now coming to the crux of the matter what we are interested in we are interested in this qmax now what is this qmax this is basically the urine flow rate okay now what is the value which we are looking for so the qmax if at all it is more than 15 ml per second it is normal in the normal individuals we get a q max of more than 15 ml per second if at all it is between 10 to 15 ml per second it is equivocal it is equivocal okay so it is equivocal if at all it is between 10 to 15 ml per second but if at all the q max is less than 10 ml per second what do you kind of understand because of this okay so okay let's 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 just understand this if at all let's say the q max is less than 10 ml per second what is happening in this particular patient due to one or the other reason the urine is not able to come out of the urinary bladder okay that's what is happening the urine is not able to come out of the urinary bladder there can be two main reasons for this one can be there is an obstruction in the outflow tract of this particular urine as we get in the patients of a bph which is called as a bladder outlet obstruction okay i hope you are able to understand this particular point so if at all the patient is not able to void the urine there can be two major factors the first factor can be there is an obstruction in the passage of the urine so we get this in the bph 
that is uh, bladder outlet obstruction the another another condition which can happen is maybe the bladder is not putting up the efforts only maybe the detrusor is not contracting only so if at all the detrusor will not contract will the urine from the bladder come out no it won't come out so this is a condition which you call it as a neurogenic bladder so please pay attention over here if at all the urine flow is less than 10 ml per second we may have two conditions one of the conditions is bladder outlet obstruction which is a bph because the enlarged prostatic gland is compressing the urethra and the urine is not able to come out that is one condition the another condition is maybe the bladder is not contracting its only so if at all the bladder is not contracting the urine from the bladder will not come out so that is what is called as a neurogenic bladder now we have to evaluate this we have to narrow it down to one particular diagnosis before we can advise the patient a treatment because the treatment of a neurogenic gland and the treatment of a bph it is entirely the same maybe the patients are having the similar symptoms that is a reduced flow rate okay so how to distinguish between the bladder outlet obstruction and the neurogenic bladder how we can distinguish it very simple let's kind of measure the pressure inside the urinary bladder okay so if at all the detrusor is contracting what is going to happen the pressure inside the urinary bladder will rise okay but if at all the detrusor is not contracting as in the case of the neurogenic bladder what is going to happen the pressure inside the urinary bladder will remain kind of low okay so for this we perform something which is called as a urodynamic study now again understand urodynamic study is a very very complex study don't go into the details of it for now just remember one of the factors which we get in the urodynamic study is that we are able to measure the pressure inside the bladder which is because of a detrusor contraction we call it as a p det or a p detrusor pressure because of the detrusor muscle okay so yeah if at all we get the values that the q max that is a flow rate which we got in the uroflometry if at all that value is less than 10 ml per second but the pressure like the p detrusor or the pressure inside the urinary bladder it is more than 80 centimeters of water it means that the detrusor is functioning properly but there is some or the other obstruction in the flow of the urine and this basically indicates that the patient is suffering from a bph because we have a prostate gland enlargement yes right but if at all you get a flow rate which is let's say less than 10 ml per second but at the same time when you are basically measuring the pressure in the because of the detrusor muscle you are getting that pressure as less than 60 centimeters of water so it means that the pressure inside the bladder is not getting generated and that is the reason why the patient is not voiding and this is a patient of a neurogenic bladder okay i hope you got this this is the entire evaluation of a patient of a bph i will just summarize for you in a couple of minutes just stay with me okay so what happened we had a patient who came to us with the signs and symptoms of hesitancy reduced flow nocturia all those things so we suspected that okay maybe the patient is suffering from bph good then what we did we did a pr examination in which we found that there is an enlarged prostate which is firm the overlying mucosa is kind of you know free and we are not able to reach the upper part of this particular prostate gland and we also gave the patient a IPSS score. We gave him this particular paper, he marked the scores and at the end we got to know whether the patient's symptoms are mild, whether the patient's symptoms are moderate or the patient's symptoms are severe. Then we advised the patient to let's go and get a USG done because we wanted to know at the prostate volume, we wanted to know about any post void residual volume, we wanted to know about the back pressure changes on the kidney and we wanted to know if at all there is any lymph node enlargement or something like that. Then we asked the patient to get a PSA done because maybe we are dealing with a prosthetic carcinoma, we had to be kind of sure about it. If at all the PSA is more than 3, we are justifiable to go in for a biopsy. Then we performed a uroflometry. You understood what is a uroflometry? On the uroflometry what we got was, we got a Q max. Now, if at all the Q max was less than 10 ml per second, we knew that there can be two possibilities. One of the possibilities, definitely it can be BPH, but the other possibility can be neurogenic bladder. And we had to distinguish between these two. And that is why we went in for a urodynamic study in which we measured the pressure inside the urinary bladder. So if at all we got a Q max of less than 10 ml per second and uh, per second, and we got a kind of a P detrusor of more than uh, 80 centimeters of water we indicated that the patient is suffering from a bph okay so by doing all these investigations and by doing all these things we came to the diagnosis that the patient is suffering from a bph okay right now the patient will get frustrated and he will say guys i mean doctor please treat me i mean enough of investigations now let's go and treat me 
so you will say okay so the patient came to you with all the reports whatever this kind of things which you had said so maybe the patient had a ipsl score of let's say 20 the prostate size was let's say 50 cc no back pressure changes were present at this particular moment and the post void residual volume was let's say 60 ml which is significant and the psa level was let's say 6 nanograms per ml q max was 8 ml per second and the p detrusive was let's say 86 centimeters of water so okay you did a biopsy in which no kind of a prostatic carcinoma was detected and you diagnosed the patient to be suffering from a bph now you want to start the treatment of this particular patient how will you treat it how will you treat this particular patient first you will go for a you have two options you can either go for a medical management or you can go for a surgical management so these are the two options which are available with you now before we can decide decide upon what is a medical management how will you treat it let us kind of revise the basis of the anatomy of the prostate so if you just kind of recollect the prostate it is consisting of the muscles uh, like it has a muscle component in it and it also has a kind of a stromal component in it okay so it has a muscle component it has a stromal component so the muscle component of the prostate that is under the effect of alpha 1a receptors okay so it is under the effect of the alpha 1a receptors what about the stromal component so stroma is again consisting of the epithelium and the collagen so the epithelium of the stroma that is basically under the effect of a dihydrotestosterone now how is this dihydrotestosterone formed so our testes basically produce a testosterone and this testosterone is converted to dihydrotestosterone by the enzyme 5 alpha reductase okay so this basic kind of uh, thing i'm sure you must be knowing this i'm just trying to revise it for you so that you kind of get to know where are we targeting the medical therapy in this particular patient okay so very simple prostate consisting of muscle and the stroma muscle is under the effect of alpha 1a receptors the stroma consisting of the epithelium and this kind of collagen the epithelium component of the prostate that is under the effect of a dihydrotestosterone which is in fact formed from the testosterone by the action of 5 alpha reductase enzyme okay now what are the available three medical options with us so what do you think so we can okay so let's kind of uh, look at this particular thing so what we can do we can block the alpha 1 receptors yes we can do that or we can kind of inhibit this particular enzyme this 5 alpha reductase we can do that okay so these are the two medical options available with us so let us evaluate so what are the two options available with us we can either go for a alpha 1 receptor blocker or we can go for a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor okay right so what is a alpha 1a receptor blocker which you kind of most commonly use we basically go for tamsulosin okay so the most commonly which obviously you must be knowing is a tamsulosin so we you here go for a tamsulosin okay now what is a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor which we most commonly go for is we go for a finasteride finasteride okay so these are the two drugs which are very very commonly used okay right so and let me just ask you out of these two like if you use a 5 alpha reductase blocker inhibitor or if you use a alpha 1a receptor blocker what do you think will give you the effect immediately or let's say within a couple of days which of these particular inhibition will give you the effect immediately definitely the answer is alpha 1a receptor blocker because it is working on the neuronal level okay so as soon as you block this particular receptor the effect of the muscles will kind of reduce the muscles will relax and the kind of outflow tract will open up and the flow rate will increase but even if you kind of inhibit this 5 alpha reductase it will take time for the epithelium to kind of downgrade it will take time for the prostate gland size to reduce down it will take time okay so that is the reason why the first point which you need to understand is that with the alpha 1a blocker what do you get you get a rapid onset of action very very important with the alpha 1a blocker you get a rapid onset of action but the 5 alpha reductase inhibitor you have a delayed onset of the action the effects are started to see in one month but for the maximum effect to kind of getting evident we have to wait for six months okay so we have to continue this particular therapy for six months in like if at all we want to see the maximum effect which it can bring very important point okay so alpha 1a blockers immediate effect and the 5 alpha reductase inhibitor we get a delayed effect okay now let us talk about the side effect so what do you think is the side effect of a tamsulosin one of the very very important side effects is retrograde ejaculation you cannot afford to forget it okay so retrograde ejaculation it is a very important side effect of um, alpha 1a blocker that is a tamsulosin now can you please tell me why do you get a, a retrograde ejaculation okay don't tell me but just kind of uh, you know in your mind just kind of walk through just tell yourself why do you get a retrograde ejaculation very very important it will solve a lot of concepts in your mind 
okay so let me just explain you why do you get a retrograde ejaculation so this particular diagram will help you in understanding that so first of all let me ask you what is the position of an internal urethral sphincter and what is the position of an external urethral sphincter so please understand internal urethral sphincter is basically present at the bladder neck okay so internal urethral sphincter is present at the bladder neck and the external urethral sphincter is basically present alongside the membranous urethra in the urogenital diaphragm okay alongside the membranous urethra in the urogenital diaphragm very very important okay now what is this white colored thing which i have drawn this is veru montanum so what is a veru montanum veru montanum is a part where the seminal vesicles and like the duct of the seminal vesicle is joined the duct of the vas deferens leading to the ejaculatory duct and this ejaculatory duct opens into the prostatic urethra at the veru montanum okay so this particular ejaculatory duct is bringing the sperms now very very important question is uh, we have two things right when the, whenever the, there's a sexual problem like yeah so what what do we have we have an erection of the penis and we have a ejaculation so we have a erection of the penis and then we have a ejaculation okay now what you need to understand is that what you need to understand is that erection of the penis is it a sim it is is it intended a sympathetic stimulation or is it a parasympathetic stimulation so please understand erection is under the control of a parasympathetic activity it is under the effect of a parasympathetic activity and the ejaculation this is under the effect of a sympathetic activity okay how you can remember this you can remember it by the mnemonic sympathetic shoots okay sympathetic shoots it means that sympathetic activity basically governs the ejaculation okay clear so okay so whenever there is an ejaculation what is going to happen the sperms will basically get transferred from this ejaculatory duct into the prosthetic urethra now there are two ways like two pathways for the sperm to go either it can go up or it can go down it can enter into the bulbar urethra from the penile urethra it can come out these are the two pathways which we have what did i just tell you ejaculation is under the sympathetic stimulation if at all there is a sympathetic overstimulation what is going to happen this internal urethral sphincter is going to close why because here what do you have here you have a alpha 1a receptors so because of this alpha 1a receptors whenever there is a sympathetic activity these particular internal urethral sphincter is going to get closed and that is why the only pathway for the sperm to go out is through the penile urethra outside and that is why normally we do not get any retrograde ejaculation okay what you are doing in this particular patient if at all you are giving the patient tamsulus and what you are doing you are basically blocking these alpha 1a receptors if you block these alpha 1a receptors what is going to happen whatever the sperm will travel from this ejaculatory duct it will enter into the prostatic urethra but because you have already blocked the alpha 1a receptors it will not go like it will have an option of going into the bladder also so that is why the sperms will enter into the bladder and that is the reason why you will get retrograde ejaculation in this particular patient okay so it is really really good to understand why do you get retrograde ejaculation in the patients in whom you are giving tamsulosin i hope you have understood this i'll just revise it in one second so normally what do we have we have an interurethral urethral sphincter which is basically getting contracted because ejaculation is a sympathetic activity and because of this the sperms have only one way to go that is outside but if at all you are giving the patient alpha 1a receptor blocker what is going to happen the internal urethral sphincter will be kind of relaxed it will not kind of contract and that is why with the ejaculation the sperms may enter into the urinary bladder and that is why you get retrograde ejaculation you hope you understood it guys okay right now what is the other thing we may get a postural hypotension so let's say if at all you are using a alpha blocker which is not that selective okay so what do we have we have alpha 1a receptors which are predominantly present on the prostatic capsule and the interurethral sphincter but we have alpha 1b receptors which are basically present on the blood vessels so if at all your alpha alpha blocker is not selective you may end up with a postural hypotension which is not a good thing in the elderly patients and lastly we can have a dizziness and the nausea this is because of the central nervous like cns side effect of this okay right in this particular 5 alpha reductase what you will have is a loss of libido why because the dihydrotestosterone levels will reduce down and ultimately it will basically lead to a loss of libido in these particular patients okay so i hope you understood these are the couple of points which you need to remember about the medical management of a patients of a bph now there are three important questions which can be asked related to this it is more kind of an integration with the pharmacology so let me just ask you so let's say if at all 
in the particular scenario the they are giving you a scenario that there is a patient who is let's say young like 30 years old and the patient is kind of sexually active man and he is kind of suffering from a bph or due to any damn reason he needs an alpha blocker what is the alpha blocker which will you which you will prefer in these particular patients so please understand the answer is alpha zosin alpha zosin is alpha blocker which you will prefer in this particular patient why because alpha zosin it doesn't have a lot of retrograde ejaculation as a side effect so simple if at all let's say there is a 30 year old man coming to you with a bph demanding for a medical treatment you want to give alpha blocker do not give tamsulosin you can give alpha zosin so that the retrograde ejaculation is not much in this particular patient next question so let's say there is a kind of a patient who is elderly patient okay and you, you want to give a alpha blocker to this particular patient so what you will give you will give psilidocin why because with the psilidocin you do not have that postural hypertension uh, that common you can get a retrograde ejaculation but the elderly people they are not really concerned about retrograde ejaculation so that is the reason why in the elderly patient what do you prefer you prefer to give psilidocin so please understand young patients you give alpha zosin in the elderly patients you give psilidocin now sometimes what happens because of the chronic obstruction the urinary bladder can get converted into an overactive bladder okay so if at all you have this overactive bladder kind of a side effects uh, or the features in the patients of a bph you always have to combine whatever the medical therapy you are giving with an anticholinergic or you can basically give this alpha blocker which is naftopidil naftopidil now why are we giving a naftopidil in these particular patients because naftopidil is a alpha 1d blocker please pay attention over here okay please pay attention so what did i tell you alpha 1a receptors are mostly concentrated at the bladder neck and uh, the prosthetic capsule alpha 1b receptors are basically concentrated on the blood vessels the alpha 1d receptors are basically concentrated on the urinary bladder so that is the reason if at all you give this naftopidil it will go and it will block these alpha 1d receptors and that will lead to an kind of it will help in kind of uh, treating the signs and symptoms of overactive bladder so very very simple if at all you have an overactive bladder if you want to give the patients an alpha blocker prefer to go for an naftopidil because it is a it has a alpha 1d blocker activity okay okay that's all about the kind of uh, medical management which you have in these particular patients right now the patients might come back to you and patient might ask you uh, doctor when will you go for a surgery okay will i ever get a surgery when will you go for a surgery so this is very very important guys what is an indication of going in for a surgery in the patients of a bph what are the indications do you remember in the usg what did we do in the usg we ruled out the bilateral hydronephrosis yes you remember that so yes if at all there is a bilateral hydronephrosis that is an absolute indication of going in for a surgery very very important then if at all let's say there is a refractory urinary retention so what do you understand by this refractory urinary retention so there was a urinary retention you went in you catheterized the patient and the patient's your kind of obstruction got relieved um, you know and then the, you send the patient home the patient is again coming to you with a acute urinary retention that is what is called as a refractory urinary retention which you have tried to treat with the mechanical methods and maybe by the, some kind of uh, drug methods but still the patient is coming to you with a repeated urine like acute urinary retention that is what you refer to as a refractory urinary retention then you can have a recurrent urinary tract infection then bladder diverticulum so what do you understand by bladder diverticulum because so if at all there is a uh, formation of a bladder diverticulum it means that there is a very very high pressure inside the urinary bladder and if at all you don't treat at this particular moment ultimately the kidneys might get affected because of the back pressure changes bladder stones again the same thing and hematuria very very important guys so whatever the list you are having over here absolutely must you know these are the indications of going in for a surgery in the patients of a bph now the last point is if at all this particular patient develops hematuria after let's say a couple of days what is the surgery which what is the treatment of choice the treatment of choice which you have is turp i hope you got this the treatment of choice still is a turp that is the preferred surgery which will go in this particular patient so that is all about whatever i wish to talk to you about the bph guys just give me a couple of minutes i'll just revise the entire clinical scenario for you so that whatever we have read till now it will just get consolidated okay right so what did we have we had a patient who came to us with the urinary tract symptoms the okay luts that is a lower urinary tract symptoms what did you do you went in and basically you did an examination you did a pr examination in which you find a kind of a firm prostate which was enlarged in size and all the features like the mucosa and everything was free 
you also evaluate it with the help of a IPSS score. IPSS score gave you the severity of the symptoms in this particular patient. Okay, so if at all it was 1 to 7, you labeled it as a mild symptoms. If at all it was between 8 to 19, you labeled it as a moderate symptoms. If at all it was between 20 to 35, you labeled it as a severe symptoms. Then you went in for an investigation. You first went in for a USG in which you were interested in the prostate size, volume, post void residual volume, back pressure changes and any lymph node enlargement. You got to know all these things. You went in for a PSA because if at all the PSA is more than three, you are justifiable to go in for a biopsy and rule out any prosthetic malignancy. Then you went in for a urophilometry because you wanted to evaluate whether the patient is actually having symptoms or not. So yeah, you went in for a urophilometry. The minimum voided volume should be around 150 ml. And when you get the results, if at all the flow rate, you are basically interested in Qmax, maximum flow rate. If at all that is less than 10 ml per second, it means that one, the patient is having, let's say, BPH or a bladder outlet obstruction. Second, the patient is having neurogenic bladder. Any of these two conditions can be present. So how to distinguish? You went in for a urodynamic study. You went in and kind of measured the pressure inside the bladder. If at all the pressure was more than 80 centimeters of water with the Q max of less than 10 ml per second, bam, you had a diagnosis of a BPH. Then we wanted to treat this particular patient. So we basically knew that we can either give the patients an alpha 1 blocker, which will basically go and kind of uh, act on the muscle component of the prostate, or we can give the patients a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, which will basically go and act on the epithelium component of the prostate. So we had two drugs. We went in either for a tamsulosin or we went in for a finasteride. We knew that if at all we give the tamsulosin, the onset of reaction will be very, very rapid. If at all we go in for a finasteride, the onset of action will be delayed. But yes, we will get a maximum action in six months of the treatment. Then we saw the side effects. So we uh, saw in detail why will we get a retrograde ejaculation. I hope you understood it. And then with the 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, what the side effect which we have? We had a loss of libido. Along with the retrograde ejaculation, important side effects of the alpha 1 blockers were postural hypertension and the dizziness and the nausea. Right. So this basically explained you because if you give a tamsulosin, the interurinary sphincter will get relaxed and whenever there is ejaculation, the sperms can enter into the bladder and that is why we will get a retrograde ejaculation. Right. So if at all we had a person who is kind of sexually active, young, don't want kind of retrograde ejaculation as one of the side effects, preferred drug to be given is alphazosin. At the same time, if at all you have an elderly patient in which least bothered about the retrograde ejaculation, but doesn't want postural hypertension. So you went in for a celadosin. That is a preferred option. And lastly, if at all the patient is having a BPH along with the overactive bladder symptoms, you went in for a naftopidal. That is a preferred option. Ultimately, if at all the patient developed a bilateral hydronephrosis, or a refractory urinary retention, recurrent UTI, bladder diverticulum, bladder stone or the hematuria, you went in for a surgery and till date, the treatment of choice for the TU like uh, BPH is a TURP. So guys, that is all for this particular session. I hope you gained something out of it. I hope you understood it. I hope it was fun for you to read BPH with me. It was indeed a pleasure interacting with you. So guys, I hope you like this, my method of teaching. I hope you like this. And if at all, you wish to learn surgery from me in such conceptual manner, I will be teaching live on an academy in the kind of a course which is called as a foundation course, foundation batch course for the NEET 2021. The classes in this foundation batch course of the surgery are going to start from 21st, like 21st of this particular month, 21st of May. And yes, I will be teaching the entire general surgery in such conceptual manner uh, in 99 hours. So I would be thrilled to basically connecting with you on this particular foundation batch course. Please do consider joining with me. I'll be more than happy to connect with you over there. Right. And if at all you wish to join, please do consider using my promo code that is tr.pavan. You will get 10% off on whatever kind of subscription you choose for. So you join, you don't join. That's completely fine. But I am there and I'll be more than thrilled to connect with you on this particular platform and have a discussion about surgery with you. So guys, thank you so much for having a look at this particular video. It was indeed a pleasure interacting with you. And yes, see you in the next session sooner. And yeah, if you have any constructive feedbacks, if you have any doubts put in to this particular question or in general, please put it down in the comment box. I'll be more than happy to get back to you. And yeah, thank you guys. Thank you for your time. I hope you gained something out of it. See ya. Bye.